Welcome to Dunkeld and our worship for August the 7th. The theme we're following just now is some of the stories that Jesus told, which form a significant part of his teaching recorded in the Gospels. And we all love a good story, so they are passages which are remembered easily, to which we return again and again as we look for fresh meaning. The one we're looking at today is probably the best known of all and appeals to believer and non-believer alike, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It was provoked by a question from a lawyer in the crowd who wanted to know about eternal life and the result was this story about the man who fell amongst robbers. And it's a parable that gives us a profound message about what right religion looks like and about our common humanity that reaches out across all the barriers and the boundaries that we erect. So we'll start our worship with a much-loved psalm which affirms God's universal invitation, all people that on earth do dwell. Beloved God, with the eagerness of a child, you wait for our coming. With the urgency of a lover, you long for our return. With the anxious heart of a parent, your arms ache to hold us. And we, who would come, restless or reluctant, weary or wary, hurting and yet hoping beyond hope, stand still, undecided. We are drawn by the promise of your kindness, but we are afraid of your disappointment, of your judgment, of your turning away from us. So many people have let us down, failed to deliver, refused us as we really are. Are you one more shattered hope? No one could blame you if you closed your door. For we too 
have been the failures, the betrayers, the deniers. We too have hurt and hurt and hurt again. Give us a moment, God, to face our fears and failures, a moment to admit our need of your love. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. O oh, beloved God, you are still there, still eager, still waiting patiently with arms wide open. The disappointment, the judgment, the turning away, that's us, not you. Forgive us and heal us of all in us that recoils from our common humanity. All pride, all fear, all disgust, all shame. You have given us such worth. Help us to take all creation at your valuation and to know ourselves precious and loved. We are coming home to you. Amen. Last time I looked at the parable of the rich fool provoked by a questioner in the crowd who asks Jesus to settle an inheritance dispute between him and his brother. This parable is provoked also by a question from a lawyer in the crowd, but it's about a different kind of inheritance. This man wants to know how you, you would inherit eternal life. And the context here has got something to teach us before we get into the parable itself. Jesus throws the question back on the man. What do you say? What's your reading of scripture? And the man says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus says, you're right. Do this and you will live. But it's what follows that's the telling bit. Because it says then, wanting to justify his question, or as some translate it, wanting to justify himself. He asks a further question, who is my neighbour? Now it could just be that like the rest of us, no one likes being caught out. And he'd asked a question to which he already knew the answer, so why had he asked it? Was he just trying to trap Jesus, trip him up somehow? So he's got to justify his question. Or it could be, as some translate it, he's got to justify himself. That he knows the answer, but what does it mean? Where do I draw the line? And he's got to prove or convince himself that he's doing enough in the loving of neighbours department to get into heaven. And in that regard, he's doing what we're all good at. We know what's required of us. And we probably know in our heart of hearts that we're not fulfilling it a lot of the time. So instead of changing and, and beginning again, we try and justify our behaviour, justify what we are. As Willie Barclay pointed out once, it's not the bits of the Bible I don't understand that bother me, it's the bits I do understand. Because when you read things like love your enemies, that's quite plain and, and quite understandable. It's just the doing of it that's difficult. What does it mean to love our enemies? Here it says, what does it mean to love our neighbour? Have we done it? Have we done enough to justify our actions and therefore convince ourselves and convince God and others that we've met the standard? And we all do it. We decide what we want to do and then we go to the Bible to justify it. So we treat the Bible more like a mirror than a searchlight. We look for arguments to bolster what we do and why we are the way we are. In a moment, we'll touch on that in the parable itself with the priest and the Levite who walk on by on the other side. They could probably think of 101 good reasons for doing nothing. 
so they would justify themselves while still thinking they are keeping the law, believing that I'm an all right sort of guy. But you see, Jesus asks us to look deeper than that, to look into our hearts, not just to justify ourselves or our questions or whatever it may be, but to look at the benchmark he sets and ask, do we get anywhere near that? Do we do what the law requires? And so the parable, here's what it means to be a good neighbour. The Parable of the Good Samaritan On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I will return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So let's get into the parable properly now, which is a story with many layers of meaning and avenues we could explore. We just can't do justice to them all in one go. So we'll have to narrow it down a bit. And on one level, this is a story about right religion. The baddies in the story here are the priest and the Levite, who are two orthodox figures who, on the face of it, are very religious men, and they do nothing. A bit of a surprise, perhaps, to folk in the crowd that day, but maybe so far they're still with Jesus because, well, it, the hero of the hour might be one of their scribes, or even better, one of their own type, an ordinary Israelite who comes to the rescue. And they might be thinking, oh, well, you know, these religious figures, they do, they say all the right things, but who knows, they maybe don't live up to it. These religious fanatics can get things out of proportion from time to time. So, so far, they're still with Jesus here. And it reflects a caricature of religion that many folk would still hold today about the function, the purpose of religion that these two characters embody. It's all about ritual. It's all about tradition, orthodoxy, mumbo jumbo really, dogma that no one really believes, but totally detached from real life. About people who will tell you what to believe and what to do, but not be very good at it themselves. All about the holy place and doing things in the sanctuary. Now, we can only guess at the thought processes of these two men, but there could be several reasons they had to justify 
passing by on the other side. If they were heading down to Jerusalem to the temple, maybe they had a very important function and they were important people. So if they stop and help this man, they'll not be able to come and do what they've got to do. Or worse still, maybe if they go and help the man, they'll discover he's dead. And if they touch him, then they are ritually unclean for a specified time and they can't come into the holy place and do all the things that have got to be done. Or maybe just on a human level, they were feared. It might be a trap. This could be a decoy. And if they turn round and help this man, it could be he's got friends hiding behind the rocks, just waiting to jump on them. So all in all, best just to get on the go because they're frightened about what might happen. Or perhaps it's something we're all good at, that they're thinking, nobody can see me. There's no CCTV cameras here, so I can do what I want. Never tell anybody and they'll never know and I can maintain the thin veneer of respectability. Still pretend to be charitable and kind and nobody will know the difference. Whatever the reason, it results in the same thing. They both pass by on the other side. And so they embody the view that many still have of religion, that it's out of touch. It's all about heaven and nothing to do with earth and the here and now. It's all about the holy place and not living out discipleship. But faith is so much more than that. It's much more than ritual and fancy language, much more than knowing your Magnificat from your Nunc Dimittis. It's about following. And, and so often we look for places to draw the line to convince ourselves and others that we've fulfilled all righteousness. We draw lines in the sand and say, as long as I do this, I'm okay. But in Jesus' view of things, wherever there is human need, doesn't matter where or what. Where there's need and we can help, there is the call of God. When the Old Testament states that we are to love God and we are to love our neighbour as we love ourselves, it's defining what true religion is about. It's about how we treat each other in the name of the God of love. We are, we are impelled by that love to go and share it. You know, it's said that when he was in South Africa as a young man, Mahatma Gandhi was training as a lawyer and he, he was interested in Christianity. He was very drawn to the teachings and the example of Jesus. So much so that he considered converting to Christianity. So he took himself off to a church one day to explore further, only to be told by the people in the door that he was not allowed in. The church for people like him, for Indians, was down the road a bit and he should go there. That was the end of his flirtation with Christianity. See, Christ's followers do the church, do the kingdom such disservice when we ignore our neighbour in favour of ritual purity or piety or dogmatic certainty. Right religion is about the love of God, which impels us then to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. And 
The reason this parable has such universal appeal, though, is because it's about our common humanity. It's just simply one man reaching out to another to help. And in doing so, he breaks down barriers and divisions which have been built up over years. The divisions inferred in the story are well known. We know that there was acrimony between Jews and Samaritans from a, a long time ago, a historical split. And that was perpetuated from generation to generation. Remember the story in John chapter 4, where Jesus is at Jacob's well, and he asks a Samaritan woman for a drink. And she's astonished. Not just a, a male and a Jew would ask her, a Samaritan woman, for a drink, but it says in the it explains in the passage that Jews and Samaritans wouldn't use the same drinking vessels or plates. And so the woman is astonished. And like so many of these divisions, we retain the, the worst venom for those who are closest to us of the same stock, Jew and Samaritan, Protestant and Catholic, Christian and Muslim, Jew and Arab, gay and straight, black and white, Russian and Ukrainian. So the list goes on. It's as old and as wide as humanity itself. And the tactics we use are the same. We bolster the division by creating myths and stories about that other lot. They're not the same as us. They're, they're bad. They don't eat the same. They're cruel to their children. They're nasty to foreigners, whatever it may be. And we build the story and we isolate. So we filter what comes in through the media to tell the story in a way that fits the narrative. And as we isolate, we create more suspicion and fear and the belief that we are the best, here's to us, was like us kind of thing. And religion has played its part, sadly. Why is it that some folk, many folk, have enough religion to hate, but not enough to love? You know, th this week we saw the funeral of David Trimble in Northern Ireland, and there's an example of what the change that has to occur, the bitter, acrimonious divisions that, are, that were there for generations took the bravery of him and folk on the other side to reach out, hold out a hand and say, enough is enough, let's build peace and let's get to know each other. 
because the more we divide, the more we build walls and isolate, the greater the fear and the suspicion. And maybe even the way we use this story contributes to it. We call it the Good Samaritan, as if to imply he's the only one. You know, the Samaritans are still a bad lot, but there is one or two uh, good ones amongst them who they're the exceptions that prove the rule. The kind of thing we would still do today where we might say, well, our, our neighbour's a Muslim, but he's a nice chap, you know, or, you know, our neighbour's actually very helpful and kind. He's a Catholic or he's a Protestant, as if to say, well, the general population of that lot's still bad, but there are one or two good eggs amongst them who are honourable. But you see, the hero in this story is the Samaritan, the low-life foreigner. And Jesus is asking his hearers and us to take a fresh look at the people we would dismiss and put down and think again. It's worth noticing that the victim in the story is not identified at all. I've just always kind of assumed, I suppose, that he was a Jew, an Israelite. And so it's kind of the idea that benevolence offered to the underdog is a good thing. But actually, the man who's the victim is neither here nor there. The focus of the story is the hero, the Samaritan. This low-life, foreign heretic is the good man, the one who is actually closer to the kingdom of God and closer to right religion than the priest and the Levite who thought they were, because he does something to help. And so we're asked through the story to take another look at those we would dismiss. I don't know if you saw this week some of the obituaries to Roy Hackett, who died aged 93. I didn't know a thing about him. I didn't even know the story, but it's a fascinating story. He was one of the Windrush generation who came into Britain and settled in England, but struggled to get a job. He tried to get a job in the Bristol Bus Company and, and was turned down because their policy was not to employ blacks. And the really shocking thing was to see clips from the time of people who were interviewed saying, well, we can't employ these black people because there'll be no jobs for the white folk. Or to see boarding house windows with a sign up saying, no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. But Roy Hackett was undeterred. He and others amongst his number organised a bus boycott and they would not use the buses in Bristol until the company changed its policy. And they did. And they began to employ people like Roy. And it led to the Race Equalities Act to change the way we think and the way we live. We still have a long way to go, and of course we do. And there are still many divisions throughout the world. And sadly, churches can contribute to that from time to time. But the plea of this parable is to understand that religion is not to be detached from the real world, but is to lead us into it in the name of the God of love, to understand God's love and therefore our common humanity. And that because God loves us, and we proclaim to love God, we are to love our neighbours as, as we love ourselves. That's right religion. Who is my neighbour? Anybody. Doesn't matter. Go and help. Yeah.
Father, we come before you. Aware of our shortcomings. Aware that we don't always see what is going on around us. Help us to be aware of other people and offer the hand of friendship whenever we can. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we recognise the hard job, the professionals, the peacemakers, the politicians and our own church leaders have to do. And we ask you to give them wisdom and encouragement. We pray that they may all work together to ease poverty in our nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, help us to begin to understand and identify ways we can help as a church. Help us not to bury our heads in the sand, but to have the courage to stand up and be counted. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we bring before you in a moment of silence friends, people we know who are grieving, anxious, despairing, asking that in your loving arms they may find comfort and relief. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.
Jesus. Amen.